All right, folks, it's the 6th. Everything's a bit calmer today. The fireworks are less. Uh, it was bonfire night yesterday, so we had to deal with that. Uh, the dog's fine. He did eventually calm down. The only one hurt was me. Uh, he sliced open one of my fingers with his weird little velociraptor claws. <laughs> Everything's... Yeah, and the American the America situation seems to be wrapping up, so I actually slept a little bit yesterday. So this is this is nice. Um just before we start I wanted to say this this seems like we're staring in a potentially dangerous territory. Don't worry everyone, it's the funny skeleton. The funny skeleton's showing up. Anyway. Um this chapter's running quite long compared to the first one. I mean, we did split it off. Let us see, you didn't see. Uh, I can't actually remember how long it was. It was like four and a half thousand? Maybe closer to five thousand? Yeah, so we're quite a bit longer than it on this one. Uh, we are wrapping up though, we're very near the end. Probably. I think uh, we're definitely going to finish. Sorry. Um, I think we're definitely going to finish this chapter and probably start the next one uh, in the next session. So that's exciting. Anyway, the first Zach section. Wasn't really sure what I was uh, trying to accomplish with this. I'm, I don't know. I, we we vibed with the character for a while. This, if it ever made it into a finished piece, it would be in a completely different form. It would be irrecognizable. But I'm enjoying the character. I'm enjoying all my characters this year. I'm enjoying my story. I've been uh, putting some thought into the the villains and the farm they'll take and where they came from. And that's been very fun as well. Although we did write very slowly yesterday. The 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 vibe was distracted. Anyway. Zack, too, was lost. He'd taken off in a blind panic as soon as the roof started to buckle, stopping only for the time it took for a backwards glance over his shoulder. April had gone down under the rubble as the tunnel collapsed, and he'd taken off again. About 30 seconds of full-blown sprinting lair, he was fairly sure he was out of the danger zone, but completely unsure of where he'd actually ended up. Was he looking for the exit now, or his potentially injured comrade? Was he being hunted, or was it all a freak accident? Should he call out, or would that be the catalyst of his own ignoble death in the darkness? What would April do if she were alive? The answer couldn't be get crushed by a rebellious ceiling. While musing, he failed to notice a small bank of stairs and stumbled down them hard, landing on his hands and knees. That seemed like a good start if he was getting into the right headspace. He listened for sounds in the darkness and heard the tail end of an unplaceable wail somewhere in the vague vicinity. He wondered how far a cry of pain might carry through the cold metal tubes of the basement. There was always the chance it wasn't April. If it wasn't April, it was someone else. If it wasn't someone else, it was something else. And if it was something else, he wanted to head the other way. Unhelpfully, he didn't know which direction it had come from. He got to his feet and was face to face with the portrait of a man with his throat cut. The body was cold blue, already beginning to rot. The blood was long dry and the subject's mouth hung limply open. The plaque at the bottom labelled it a self-portrait. He closed his eyes. Don't look at it. Don't think of it. He muttered it out loud. The painting was clearly a cult, an icon to something beyond the scope of human understanding. Eh, understanding. It had been hard to stop looking at. That was worrying. He remembered the advice he'd been given back when he was new at all this. If you're looking at them, you've got to assume they're looking back at you. And never be too slow to run. Zack turned sharply away from the painting and jogged a little way down the hall, just in case. He tried his best to keep the beam of his torch away from all the horrific things around him, but it was all a lot to take in solo. He was fully aware he'd been doing poorly when there were two of them. Another sound rang out distantly. It was high enough, to, high enough in pitch to be a shriek. There were a hundred things it could have been, but it was probably April. Could he live with himself if he didn't at least try and help her? If he moved faster, he decided, he'd either be sure that he was getting closer or further away. And if he got closer, he could get help. And if he got further away, he'd probably be heading towards an exit, wherein he could find an adult to come resolve the situation for him. If he got closer and it wasn't April, don't think of it. The painting had burned an afterimage directly into his brain, his eyes following him through the hallways. He wondered if it had been abandoned down here as some kind of security measure. Before he could shake the thought, the creeping feeling that every painting in the building was looking at him began to manifest. 
Without even thinking, he ducked out of the corridor and into one of the adjoining rooms. The room was spacious and high ceilinged, decorated with notable finery even compared to what he'd seen previously. From the roof hung a horrific granite carved idol. Yeah, a horrific granite carved idol, in the form of a mass of tangled tentacles leading off into shadows so black his light couldn't dispel them. Underneath a single hide... Underneath... Comma, that, that, there was already a comma, I just missed it. A single high door loomed suspiciously. There was evidence of a fire in several places, all long burned out, and in the centre of the room was a pit. The pit had no visible, but I want to change that to observable. Yeah, let's do that. Just a better word, and probably one I'll use less often. The pit had no observable bottom. It went all the way down. There were no paintings, at least, but he didn't want to walk underneath the idol. There seemed to be a pretty obvious sequence of events that could happen here, and if he wasn't altogether... And he wasn't altogether that keen to find out how deep the hole was. April called again, and it was Klaus. He was now sure it was her, and fairly confident that she was swearing at him. He didn't know if there were extenuating circumstances she might be screaming at. He had, however, managed to put himself in a mental state where every inch of the building had become terrifying. Back was as scary as forwards. He looked up at the abomination the room was built around. The big stone monstrosity. He certainly hoped it was stone. Another cry rang out, and he realised one of his lessons could be applied to this situation too. If he were to, for one moment, allow a noble thought to take him, his friend was in danger, and he should never be too slow to run. He shifted his weight from one foot to the other, very interested to find out what he might do next. Then he yelled, Fuck it, and ran towards the screams. For the next section, um... I really like writing kind of I think this went on too long. Definitely needs editing. A lot of people struggle with fight scenes, so if you if you're one of those people, maybe maybe tune in here. We'll see we'll see how it how it how it went. Um one thing I do really like writing is fight scenes where both participants are terrible at fighting. And they're just kind of stumbling around, missing each other, falling over. Uh, <laughs> So that's basically what this was. This is why I kind of put the whole uh, Adam coming back thing in. And it also, I don't know, kind of gets everyone to where they're meant to be at the end. Adam, come on. I'm tired. It's late. Today's been mental. And we're mates, right? I don't know Carol from accounting, and I'm not going to rat on you. So let's just calm down a little, right? I'll go somewhere else if you're busy. Adam stopped, slightly lowering his weapon. He was definitely very conflicted on the being robbed to death with a fire extinguisher prospect. He took a single step forwards. Rob, who'd already made the de decision that if Adam made a single, a single twice, ma if Adam made a single advance on him, he was going to attack reflexively, lobbed his cactus like a baseball at Adam's head. He ducked narrowly out of the way, and the two entered into a very awkward situation. Let's change that to stare down. <laughs> yeah, we're changing all the words today. It's even an extra word. We just generate a free word from thin air. Magic. Oops. Rob tried. Yeah! Adam responded. Face a mask of rage. Battle cry still echoing. He threw himself... Yeah, okay, there's, there's a lot of commas there. But it was a full stop before. Battle cry still echoing. He threw himself at Rob, who dodged low and to the left. Don't know why left specifically. <laughs> Rob kept moving and came out of the action behind Adam as the fire extinguisher impacted on nothing but air in the spot he'd been a moment ago. It was a slow and cumbersome weapon, and Adam kept having to stop his attack to adjust his grip on it. Nonetheless, the action progressed. The next swing was spaced horribly, and would have missed if Rob had remained entirely stationary. Instead, Rob jumped sharply, stumbled backwards over a potted plant, and landed on his butt. Adam had overswung so badly, Rob still had time to climb to his feet before the next attack came in. This time Adam didn't swing at all, merely charging in a straight line with the extinguisher out in front of him, yelling like a maniac. Rob again misjudged his dodge, this time because Adam stumbled over the same plant he had previously, and the pair collided. Rob was almost knocked off his feet from the strike, slumping back against the slumping against the back wall. Having been forced back a good distance, there's a lot of backs in there. It hurt quite a lot. 
and thoroughly soured his mood for whatever the hell the pair of them were doing. Adam, meanwhile, appeared quite pleased with himself after landing a strike. Calm down, you daft bastard, Rob barked, frustrated. You threw a cactus at me, Adam yelled back in an unusually cogent manner. Rob didn't have a good response to that. No, I didn't? Adam advanced again. This time Rob seized the initiative, shoving his opponent bodily as he drew closer. Rob realised then, perhaps as he should have done earlier, that Adam was an unusually small and frail man who crumpled dramatically as he found himself counterattacked. Rob felt kind of bad as he watched his murderous aggressor bounce off him quite so pathetically. Sorry. Grrr! Adam writhed on the ground like an upturned tortoise for a moment, before eventually managing to right himself. He came up slowly, as Rob looked for an exit. The fight had forced him up against the wall with all the functional lifts on it. He hit the call button on the nearest one and waited patiently as Adam came, as Adam came for him again. Rob ducked just in time for an unusually well-directed strike to miss him, impacting against the wall around head height with a dense metal thunk that told him he wouldn't have enjoyed being hit by it. Rob, realising that if he lost any more ground, it would jeopardise his chances of being able to get into the lift once it arrived, threw a straight punch in retaliation, but managed to catch the weapon instead of the attacker as he moved to defend himself. His knuckles screamed back the report that this had been a bad idea, his entire hand erupting in pain. He backed off, clutching the wounded appendage as Adam drew in, realising the extent of the dire situation when his back touched the wall. He'd put himself perfectly in the corner and disabled one of his own hands. You said you can hear them, Rob. Adam growled viciously. What are they saying now? The pin of the fire extinguisher had fallen out at some point during the fight. It was now primed to fire, and the nozzle, never something anyone had been paying much attention to up to this point, was aimed cleanly back at Adam. They're saying you ought to back off before I make a mess of you, Rob called back. It struck him that, to an outside observer, the situation must look extremely pathetic. Adam yelled a cry of pure hatred and raised his weapon for another strike. Rob had been waiting, though, and the wind-up gave him, gave him ample time to enact his plan. Before Adam could... There's a lot of reacting. I don't know. That just seems pretty strange. Like, and I'm going to have to turn my microphone off for a second in a minute. Before Adam could react, Rob had one hand on the fire extinguisher and another on the trigger. Nah, I'm good. There were things going on in the back again. Adam realised what was happening a moment before it hit him, and the next moment he was blasted. Two moments. <laughs> we'll uh, work on all these uh, double, double words at some point. The next moment he was blasted backwards in a jet of fire-repellent foam, being cleanly disarmed in the action. The inexplicable thought to... I don't know, um, he's meant to be disarmed because Rob keeps hold of the fire extinguisher when he lets go, because he's been blasted with foam. Maybe that could be explained better? Yeah, maybe. The inexplicable thought... Okay. Yeah, the inexplicable thought to end his downed opponent with one clean strike to the skull entered Rob. The usually energetic afternoon obviously having gotten to him, he instead dropped the extinguisher and got in the lift. Did the lift ever arrive? Oh, when I was messing with it, um, the moment he fired the, the extinguisher, the lift doors opened. But I apparently changed that. So so this is gonna need this is gonna need some work here. This this not this not what we're after. Well this sentence would just to remind me where we were going anyway. <coughs> Maybe you could um be thinking about Killing his downed opponent, and then the lift arrives and snaps him out of it. There might be something going on there. Ah, what, what's this all about? Why is everyone gone so crazy? Weird. Anyway, that's where we're, we're ending for today. We're going to finish off this scene. Um, then we've got to get the skeleton introduced, and we've got to get Zach and April to their lift. And then after that, we're going to end the chapter, and the team's going to going to merge to one unit. We still haven't got Piper yet, and we, we, we won't meet her till after this uh, this whole escapade. Piper didn't come on this mission. She's uh, she's at home. She's fine. Don't worry about it. Anyway, yeah, that's where we are. We're still, still confident. I don't normally like my story after a week of doing Nano. Normally, like, the first few days are really good. Then, like... I start to feel like it's going a bit off the rails, but it's still kind of working. And then for the middle part, 
I absolutely love everything I'm doing and it's a real slog to try and force myself to keep going. And then it kind of goes in reverse for the last two fifths. Like I start feeling, yeah, this is, it's kind of not great, but there's bits I can use here and there. So I might as well finish it because I'm doing some good writing here amidst all the bad. Um, maybe when I write a, a real thing, I'll I'll use that. You know, you can always use turns of phrase and uh, little passages that you've used before uh, that are too specific. And then by the end, I'm like, we're going to finish Nano, boys. We're there. We're right there. Let's go. Victory. Anyway. <laughs> nah, maybe we'll, uh, maybe we will eventually get to the point where it's getting difficult. I was going to try to do some kind of uh, challenge from the challenges thread today, but I didn't like any of them, so I didn't bother. Uh, maybe sometime. Anyway, that's it. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I could possibly say, because every time I try and press the button to stop recording, I think of something new. But anyway, good. That's all for now. Thanks for being here. Signing in.